All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, especially if you went to campus dance last night, thank you for being here. Yeah. It was my first, and it is really quite memorable. Yeah. All right. Well, it's great to be with all of you today and for this wonderful event named after Ruth B. Sauber, who through her substantial contributions as a medical student affairs officer for more than 20 years had a profound and enduring impact on the Warren Alpert Medical School and its students. So this lectureship, as many of you may know, was established in 1994 by her son having trouble hearing. Uh, okay, I, can I close this just for a second? This, okay, all right. Maybe I'll just do it partially. Okay, I'm just making sure it's on. Um, so how's that? Much better, okay. So this lectureship, as you know, was named in 1994 by Ruth's son, Richard A. Sauber, along with family and friends to pay tribute to her service, legacy and impact. So Dick and his lovely wife, Pam, are unable to join us, but they're not that far away uh, as they're attending their daughter's redo of the 2020 uh, commencement this morning. But I, I recently had a chance to meet with them when I was in Washington, had dinner at their home, uh, and learned a lot about Ruth, who was clearly a remarkable, inspiring figure. I also learned that Pam is a gourmet cook. Um, and and it's in, in that spirit of dedication, selflessness for the betterment of society that we gather in Ruth Sauber's name to acknowledge the influence, the impact of distinguished alums, such as our honoree today, who I have, I have the great privilege of introducing now. So Dr. Kavita Babu, has demonstrated throughout her career that the practice of medicine is a human service profession of the highest order that when done well, focuses on individuals during their most vulnerable moments with a focus on healing. You'll see from her shared bio within your programs that Dr. Babu is chief of the Division of Medical Toxicology at UMass Memorial Health and a professor of emergency medicine at UMass Chan Medical School. In 2018, she was named the Chief Opioid Officer for UMass Memorial Healthcare. As conveyed by the title of her talk, Tackling the Opioid Crisis Together, the focus of her clinical and research work is identifying and promoting strategies for opioid safety and overdose prevention, compassionate care for patients with addiction, and ultimately the goal of preventing overdose deaths. Indeed, she was the first author on a seminal 2019 New England Journal of Medicine review article entitled Prevention of Opioid Overdose. And she's recognized nationally as a content expert in regard to opioid safety and prevention of, of overdose deaths. What you won't see in her bio is what her nominators for this award said. And I'll offer one quote. Dr. Babu has worked tirelessly to combat the opioid epidemic. Since becoming the chief opioid officer for UMass Memorial Health in 2018, she has launched and directed the Road to Care Mobile Addiction Service in Worcester, Mass, a program that provides ambulatory and addiction treatment to individuals experiencing homelessness and those with opioid use disorders. She has also facilitated naloxone distribution through Worcester's EMS, increased access to medication for addiction treatment, taught X waiver courses to more than 200 physicians on buprenorphine prescribing, and implemented medication disposal boxes at the university and memorial campuses, which have led to the return of more than one ton of medications. A recipient of numerous honors and awards, Dr. Babu has been lauded for her exceptional teaching, mentoring, and with her previous mentees now serving as division chiefs of medical toxicology, NIH funded researchers, and award winning academicians. So that is really remarkable to train a uh, next generation of leaders. Please join me in welcoming Kavita Babu back to Brown and crediting the Brown Alumni Association Board of Directors for this inspired choice for this year's Ruth B. Sauber Distinguished Medical Alumni Honoree.
Kavita. I am hoping it wakes up. That's my coffee. Oh, that's yours. <laughs> Oh, we do. Thank you. It's okay. It's, uh, good morning, Dean Jane. Thank you so much. And to my friends and colleagues, Dr. Rosen, Dr. Klein, Dr. Alper, thank you so much for joining us today. As mentioned, I'm Kavita Babu. Uh, our Twitter handle, mine is at Kavita Babu or at UMass Talks. You can follow us on social media and see what we're talking about in terms of opioids. So because I'm going to be talking about some medications today, I just wanted to mention that I have no conflicts to disclose. I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you to the Sauber family. I, I actually just missed... Mrs. Sauber. I started in 1996, and it sounds like she left the med school in 1994, but it is remarkable. To this day, you say her name and people just light up. And so I, I think that in terms of the, uh, the impact that her work had on cultivating a generation or generations of physicians, thank you very much. And I'm honored to be here talking about uh, humanism in medicine and the social impact of medicine because it sounds like that's exactly her legacy. I'd like to thank Dr. Sachin Patel for thinking of me for this nomination, Dean Jane, Dr. Shin, and the Brown Medical Alumni Association for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'd like to thank Ellen and Amy for, for facilitating me being here. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the local juggernauts in sort of, and thought leaders about the opioid crisis who are here at Brown. Um, Dr. Rich's work has inspired me for more than two decades. And I feel like his work has consistently been ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about where we should go next. Dr. Barry Lester helped me get my start in this area. And then you'll see Dr. Samuels, Dr. Marshall, Dr. Bodwin. Brown is replete with folks who are working so hard to bend the curve. I'd also like to mention some of the folks who I think were Really, my, my role models in humanism in medicine as a, a medical student and as a resident, and to those of you who are familiar with these names, there are pediatricians, psychiatrists, uh, surgeons, emergency physicians, and all of them played an essential role in helping me figure out what medicine really meant and what it's like to take care of patients. I put this picture up here, though, because I, I think that this is, this is also called How an Elvis Clock Changed My Life. Um, and it was really funny. I, I actually thought when I came here that I wanted to be a surgeon. I spent a lot of time with the general surgeons in orthopedic surgery in these offices that were you know, meant for patient interactions that had sort of uh, beautiful gleaming wood and bronze hand statues and these leather volumes. And the first time I went to an emergency medicine office, um, Dr. Spitalnik and Dr. Shapiro's office, it, it was a kind of like a little bit bigger than a closet, and they had an Elvis clock on the wall with a swinging pelvis, and I was like, I think I've, I've found my people. So <laughs> this, this helped me make my decision and launch my career in emergency medicine. Among all of the lessons that I learned here uh, from those faculty members and just with the ethos of, of Brown, and again, what Mrs. Sauber I think so, so embodied, is that medicine is advocacy. And it really is, I, I like this definition of advocacy, any action that speaks in favor of, recommends, argues for a cause, supports or defends, or pleads on behalf of others. And we'll be talking more about that today. The other thing that happened while I was here at Brown was circa 2000, I met this guy, um, my, my better half, who was a Providence College graduate was working for Buddy Cianci as a speechwriter, was flipping pizza at Fellini's, um, and we met at the gym when he was sneaking in to play basketball with a bunch of Brown students. So um, this is Jim Carroll, who subsequently graduated from the medical school here in 2006. He is my partner. He's the best. He's also in the OR this morning. Um, so he's, he's not here, but he's in every molecule of the work that I've done over the past 22 years. So... If we kind of start with where I was in 2000, and if you kind of go way back to 2000, so this was the launch of the PlayStation 2, this was Bush versus Gore and hanging chads, 
the first international space station crew. And at that time, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I had about an hour long lecture on analgesia while I was a medical student. And so I ended up uh, coming into this milieu that was peppered by literature on disparities in analgesia for long bone treatment, the idea that legitimate pain did not lead to opioid use disorders or dependence, and really kind of the idea that we should, in, in sort of the well-intentioned bid to treat pain aggressively, be prescribing more opioids. Around that time, this was sort of what we might see, a 25-year-old man who presented to the emergency department after a heroin overdose. This wasn't terribly common at that time, He'd be watched in the emergency department for a period of time and discharged with the following instructions. Well-intended instructions that said, please cut down or stop using drugs. Cutting down or stopping drug use will save your life. And they'd be given phone numbers to call in order to make an appointment with a detox program. I was also at that time working in the Miriam ICU during one of my rotations, I cared for a 25-year-old man found in a bathtub full of ice and he had been submerged there by his friends after he was found not breathing. He came in with a core temp of 85 degrees Fahrenheit. His mom drove in from New York, and I, I, I still can't forget sitting across from this woman in one of the quiet little spaces of the hospital and telling her that I thought that her son was as critically ill as he could possibly be, and her composure and her poise in this horrible moment. But fortunately, in this case, he survived his encounter with heroin. So we move forward to 2006, and in 2006, it was kind of a, a lightning bolt aha moment for me when, when really the problem had pre-existed that significantly. There was a paper published in 2006 by, by Len Pelosi and his group talking about deaths in West Virginia, and they talked about this idea that people who were receiving opioid analgesics were dying because of their pain medication. Um, when they looked at these folks, they said that opioids were involved in like 93% of these overdose deaths, that there was doctor shopping or seeing more than three physicians for their opioids, and that there was diversion in about 63% of these deaths where what happened was um, people were taking opioids that weren't prescribed for them. The reason I say that this came into consciousness is because I think at this point, the opioid crisis had become widespread enough that it really it came to sort of the mainstream level of attention. Prior to this, for decades, opioids had been killing people in communities of color, but we just didn't talk about it in quite the same way until it sort of reached suburban America, urban America. All of our communities were now affected. When you look back, one of the biggest fentanyl epidemics in our country happened in 2005 in Chicago, but we don't really talk about that as much. Why? I think that the prescription opioid epidemic changed the way that we think about the problem and changed our attentiveness. This graph, I think that this is, oops, now what I did here, moving, awesome. <laughs> and thank you to Connor for resuscitating my talk. Um, so when you look at this graph, you know, I, I think that this is really important in the sense that it sort of gave us a trajectory. So when you looked at the top dotted line, that was opioid sales per kilogram per 10,000 people. So that is just the sheer weight of opioids that, that providers were putting into the community. That was paralleled by that hash line at the bottom in terms of treatment admissions and directly paralleled by that solid line in the center, which was um, opioid associated deaths. And so I think that when you looked at this, it seemed very clear at that time that the answer to the problem was deprescribing. So we started to really pull back in terms of our opioid prescribing because the writing was on the wall, that's the way we save lives. So this was the kind of patient I saw back then, a 35-year-old man presented to the emergency department with broken ribs. This was his fourth visit for the same. And we talked about transitioning to non-opioid analgesics and then he took a second and he was like, doc, I gotta tell you, I paid a guy to hit me in the chest with a lead pipe because I know that when I come into the emergency department with broken ribs, you guys will prescribe for me. And in the absence of sort of a better path at that time, I you know, talked to him about next steps. I gave him that same page with the numbers for the detox programs and discharged him with instructions for follow-up. So 2008 and 2010 were two of my favorite years, not because of great advances 
um, in the opioid crisis, but because these two showed up who are here in the front row. And <laughs> they've, they've, they've just been so awesome to spend time with this weekend. Um, but certainly being a parent is, is not a critical part of being a physician or an advocate. But in, in my path, it really changed my perspective of what it meant to break bad news and also what it meant to think about how we're growing and caring for and providing for our next generation. So we moved forward to 2012. And um, one of the things that I think was, was really formative for me is, you know, we talk about these continuing medical education meetings and, and what we get out of them. Well, the American College of Medical Toxicology at that time, we hosted a, a prescription opioid misuse academy. And I think that this was, again, sort of one of those aha moments. One of the folks who came out and spoke was from the Betty Ford Center. And what they spoke about was how many of my colleagues were affected by the opioid crisis, about the paths into treatment for physicians and APPs who were struggling with their own addictions. And really, again, I think it just reinforced the idea that the, the opidemic didn't have a target population, but sort of cross cut across all, all segments of society, across all sectors. This was one of the first times that I heard about buprenorphine, naloxone, or suboxone, a medication for opioid use disorders. So we're talking about 2012, and, and yet there are still you know, challenges with access to this life-saving medication nowadays, um, and, and the potential benefit that buprenorphine would play in caring for people with opioid use disorders. We talked about the neurobiology of addiction, and I think that this is so important because one of the challenges of this time was, again, we sort of talked about applying opioids more widely across this broad segment of the population. And the natural history of taking prescription opioids is that only a small percentage of folks will develop dependence and only a small percentage of those folks will develop an addictive disorder. In terms of dependence, the, the duration of use makes a difference. In terms of addiction, your brain chemistry has a lot to do with it. And so we started to talk much more, and I think more broadly, about this hijacking of reward pathways, looking at addictive disorders as part of a, of a brain chemistry issue rather than a moral liability. And that really changed the conversation in my mind. Because at this point, what we started talking about was the likability or the abuse liability of these opioids that they were habit forming and reinforcing on their own. And so if you just took people and, and gave them five days worth of oxycodone, or if you gave them 90 days of oxycodone, their likelihood of long-term use was going to be significant. So when you look at kind of what happened around that time, uh, circa like 2008, is when we saw that legal and illegal drug poisoning started to uh, outpace motor vehicle collisions in terms of being one of the uh, largest causes of injury deaths, and it certainly is today. But we talk about deaths without realizing that that really is the tip of the iceberg. For every one overdose death, there are nine drug treatment admissions, 35 ED visits for drug use, there's 160 people with a use disorder or dependence, and then over 450 people who are using non-medically. So at the time, um, what we saw were these incredibly thoughtful and well laid out guidelines in terms of judicious prescribing. Uh, these came out with medical associations, nursing associations, pharmacy, law enforcement, like really I thought Washington State in particular did this awesome job of having this multi-agency recommendation on restricting opioid prescribing, particularly from emergency departments. And that really thoughtful and well laid out plan was directly met by an increase in heroin overdose deaths. Because when we restricted people's access to the prescription opioids, they made the shift to elicit opioids. So around that time, another thing that I think really came to the forefront of, of sort of my consciousness was this idea of harm reduction. Harm reduction is the idea that you're using sort of a proactive and evidence-based approach to reduce the negative personal and public health impact associated with alcohol and other substance use at the individual and community levels. So what does this mean? Before you can figure out uh, like the goals of sobriety, recovery, with medication in most cases, 
what you need to do is to limit people's, um, you have to limit people's harms. Whether we're talking about infectious diseases like HIV and hepatitis C, whether we're talking about overdoses, because the natural history of these addictive disorders is that people will recover if we give them enough time, if we give them enough healthy time. I love the harm reduction community. I think they are some of the most brilliant out of the box thinkers who do such cool work. I don't really love the term harm reduction. Um, and the only reason I say so is because, you know, we don't call going to the gym harm reduction or using insulin harm reduction or taking a statin harm, they're all harm reduction, right? The whole phrase harm reduction is the othering of addictive disorders in medicine. And so while I think that this is, you know, again, it's like when you look at this on the internet, when you find people who are versed in harm reduction in your community, they're gonna be, I think, some of the most passionate people you could wanna meet. But what they're doing is they're fighting this tide of political thinking, of cultural thinking, that really kind of pushes back on getting the most evidence-based medicine, on getting big ideas into the hands of our patients. Um, so one of the harm reduction uh, efforts of the time was Narcan distribution or naloxone distribution of this narcotic antagonist distribution. And so back then from 1996 through uh, 2014, they looked at organizations that provided naloxone kits to like over 150,000 lay persons and they got over uh, 25,000 reversals. So ultimately like when you, when you do the math on this, I think it's kind of like it works out about one to seven. That is a one to six. That is a very low number needed to treat in medicine, right? Like when, when you put this product out, it's, it's safe, it's effective, it's cost effective. Um, but again, it took time for these programs to gain traction. So when I tell you that this cataclysm unfolded in 2013 to 2016, I am not exaggerating. There is no other word to describe what happened, especially sort of in our Northeastern communities around that time. Unfortunately, many areas of the United States are, are sort of having their, their moment right now. And this is where you see kind of the steepest part of the curve here. So 2013 is here. Massachusetts, these are opioid associated deaths. We went from a baseline of like five to 600, which was much too high in the aughts, to 900 in 2014, all the way up to 2100 in 2016. And really this is sort of when fentanyl made landfall in our communities. And so when you look at kind of this, this red line here and follow it down, that's heroin. Heroin is very hard to find in my community right now. What you find instead is this top dark blue line is fentanyl. And fentanyl is present and over 93% of the post-mortem toxicology of anybody who's had an opioid associated overdose in Massachusetts at this point, because it is just so ubiquitous. Um, the things to remember about fentanyl, it is a very high potency opioid. And so when we think about how, um, how effective it is, when you compare sort of fentanyl gram by gram with, with heroin, the, the amount that's in about three grains of salt is enough to precipitate a lethal overdose. It's easily modified. And so here in Rhode Island, at one point, there was a, a large acetyl fentanyl outbreak, um, car fentanyl you've perhaps heard of, but there are a lot of different substitutions on that parent molecule that can make it difficult to detect uh, and difficult for law enforcement agencies to kind of schedule proactively, although they've done a really good job recently. It's in a multitude of illicit drugs and counterfeit pharmaceuticals. And so the problem is nowadays, um, we have certainly seen high school kids that go out and they think that they're snorting Xanax and then they end up with, um, with an opioid overdose and we're able to find fentanyl or other high potency opioids. And really the, the rationale in many ways is that there's an increased profit margin in trafficking. And this, this problem is so difficult to, um, to kind of cut off because so much of the manufacture actually goes on overseas. And a lot of our fentanyl exports come from China, India, and Mexico right now. In terms of kind of why, this, this slide is, um, is older. And so I think unfortunately due to inflation, these margins are probably much larger now. If you have 25 grams of fentanyl precursors that cost about 810 to produce back then, 
it was equal to up to $800,000 of pills on the black market. So small amounts of precursors leads to big amounts of money. And you can imagine that that's something that's hard to curtail. And during this time, I felt like I was having the same conversation over and over again. And I apologize to anybody who's been on the other end of a conversation like this in this room. I would say, I'm so sorry. Despite our best efforts, your son has died. I'm so sorry. Despite our best efforts, your partner has died. Your daughter has died. And it was like, it was this incredible cycle of repetition that was so tragic. And, you know, when I think about this, it was like, I, I can't even sort of begin to, it, it's hard to put a metaphor into action for what was going on. It's like, I, I was a blade of grass on the planet of their grief, but just watching this, just being a bystander to these families' responses was brutal. And it's, I, I think it's the hardest part of our career is just this idea that we take folks who are going about their daily lives and, and we break the news that something unthinkable has happened. And that's really, I think, has propelled many of us into this work. So we started doing some research um, in 2017, talking to patients after a non-fatal overdose who had presented to the emergency department. What we learned was that our patients didn't want fentanyl. Um, they had all taken care of or, or kind of known about individuals who had recently overdosed and died. And this, like, these are small communities that 2,100 opioid users in Massachusetts, everybody had a family member, everybody had a friend who had died of an overdose. The other thing about fentanyl besides being scary was that it was really short acting. And so our patients who you know, sometimes used once or twice a day were using five to six times a day in order to just feel right. What we also learned was that our patients couldn't tell the difference between fentanyl, between fentanyl and heroin prior to effect. So, you know, they tried, we tried to kind of say, is it clear, is it white, does it cook up differently? Really until the needle was in their arm, they couldn't tell the difference and there was just no opportunity to kind of uh, intervene at that point, except for the fact that our patients were saving each other's lives. And we really got a sense of what the impact of bystander naloxone looked like at that time, because so many of our patients were presenting after they got in the lock zone from someone that they were using with or from, uh, from a family member. So in terms of kind of additional literature that emerged around that time, we learned that illicit opioid users carry 20 times the risk of death of the general population. This is not just from overdose. This is from suicide. This is from hepatitis C, HIV, trauma. Um, there are a number of reasons that this is the case. And this is a very aggressive disease process. So if you put this into your own context, whether you're talking about a cancer, whether you're talking about acute coronary syndrome, um, when we saw these patients who presented after a non-fatal overdose to the ED, 5% would die within the year. And of those, 20% would die within one month. So again, this, this aggressive disease process. Among individuals who experienced a non-fatal overdose, this was a study of like 17,000 individuals in Massachusetts who were seen in an emergency department. This is um, one of Alex Wally's studies, a, a, another thought leader in this area. What his team found was that methadone, if, if patients were offered methadone or were able to start methadone during that period of time, it decreased their risk of death by 59% for opioid-related mortality and 53% for all cause mortality. So again, you know, thinking about the medications that we commonly use, whether you're talking about um, like cholesterol lowering agents or blood pressure lowering agents, this is a huge return. You can start somebody on a medication and lower their risk of death by almost 60%. And then among individuals who experienced a non-fatal overdose, um, when they started Suboxone, you saw a similar decrease in mortality, a little bit less. Um, but again, you could decrease their mortality by 40%, essentially, for opioid-related mortality and for all causes. So I talked a little bit about how medical schools were treating opioids back in 2000. In 2016, and I know there are curricula like this here, I think this is just an incredible advance. At UMass, we had the opportunity to develop a curriculum for um, 
for talking to standardized patients about multiple different scenarios that ranged from talking about opioid analgesics all the way up to counseling somebody after an overdose. And I think that this is really critical because after all, like medicine is a soft art. And so it doesn't matter what your evidence tells you if you can't engage patients and if you can't talk to them about what the barriers are for them entering treatment. And so these are two of our standardized patients at UMass Chan um, participating in a, in a standardized patient or kind of a simulated patient encounter to talk about what the next steps were after a partner found a patient who had overdosed. Um, the other thing that kind of happened around that time, I apologize, was that, <laughs> so like out of all the titles that you can come up with for being someone who is, you know, caring for patients with opioid use disorders, the drug czars were not those guys, um, but the uh, <laughs> but the local newspaper uh, like kind of uh, officially christened me as the as the UMass drug czar. Instead, I, I prefer the term chief opioid officer. And this is this is my um, colleague and friend, Dr. Dixon, who is an emergency physician and is the CEO at UMass Memorial Health. And he asked me if I would be willing to um, steward the opioid efforts at UMass. And this is really important because. Unfortunately, despite all of the outstanding work that's gone on in this area, there is no sort of natural umbrella. I, I think maybe addiction psychiatry or addiction medicine could be at the forefront of this, but clearly it cuts across emergency medicine, infectious disease, oncology, internal medicine, family medicine, who've been just awesome leaders in this OBGYN. Um, and so he wanted to create a structure uh, through which we could, we could kind of deduplicate efforts and be most efficient with disseminating best practices. And Dr. Alper has been a critical part of that. This, um, this title gave me access to leadership, showed that my leadership had a commitment to the crisis, that they were willing to take risks, um, that they had all of these content experts that we could network and really create consensus. And so this was, this was a huge opportunity for us to push forward a lot of great ideas. Simultaneously, and, and I think that this is important because again, sort of things that, that have changed my thinking. I, I think that we're struggling right now with looking at how the legislation of medicine can adversely impact health, but there are times where it can push it forward too. And so Governor Baker actually in this, in this uh, legislation passed in 2018, required that all emergency departments would be able to provide medications for addiction treatment. You should be able to go into an emergency department in Massachusetts after an overdose and either be offered or receive a prescription for Suboxone, um, one of those life-saving medications that we talked about. And so this really, I think, again, was sort of the impetus for a lot of change that we made. So with respect to countermeasures, and, and Dean Jane mentioned some of these already, we put medication disposal boxes outside of our surgical clinics, um, and this was really driven by, by our surgeons, and I think what was a, a very elegant solution. Patients were coming back for post-operative visits with unused opioids, and the surgeons were like, you know, we don't have a place to get rid of this. We'd like to encourage them to bring those opioids back and get rid of it. Um, and so we have a medication disposal box at university right outside where many of our um, post-surgical patients are seen. You mentioned that we saw, we trained providers about Suboxone. And I think that this was really critical in terms of increasing access to treatment for our, our patients in the health system. Um, we put together some really nice tools to make Suboxone prescribing from the EDs much more facile. We actually created a tele-Suboxone program with some funding from the institution so that if you went to any of our five emergency departments, and we often do this on the floors now as well, if you didn't have an X waiver prescriber, um, one of us would be able to, to fill the gap and write a prescription to get that patient started. And I, I apologize for not mentioning this before. There is sort of an extra step. Despite the fact that Suboxone or buprenorphine and naloxone has a, has a much more favorable safety profile than products like oxycodone or Percocet or Oxycontin, in order to move from sort of the methadone clinic arena into office-based treatment, the agreement was that physicians would have or providers would have uh, some uh, additional documentation of training with the X waiver. 
Unfortunately, despite the safety of this medication, that's proven to be a significant barrier. In some cases, the Biden administration has certainly um, lowered the, the barriers and kind of like made this a little bit more facile, but it's not something that every one of your providers can do without specially filing with um, SAMHSA and the DEA. So in terms of other countermeasures, we developed Narcan, CPR, and rescue breathing videos in English and in Spanish. We secure bridge clinic funding in order to have a low barrier, uh, easily accessible clinic for our patients to be able to be seen after an overdose or really whenever they wanted to be seen by addiction psychiatry. Um, and that clinic is, is really unique, both in terms of how accessible it is, but also how far they'll go to help patients transportation, providing ID at pharmacies, social work, recovery coaches, financial counseling, in addition to medical treatment. Um, we lowered default prescribing quantities, and that was with Dr. Alper, so that when, when providers were selecting to prescribe someone Vicodin or Percocet, we were more in line with what people were actually using than the default quantities. And the default quantities often were 20 Percocet, 40 Percocet. We found most of our patients after typical surgeries were using 10 to 12, if that. So by lowering the default quantities, we were able to not you know, not be unduly burdensome to our patient population in terms of prolonged pain needing additional visits. We were, we were basing this on sort of literature from the surgical specialties, um, but actually kind of help to prevent extra opioids being in medicine cabinets and closets. We did work on the Loxone and clean injection kit distribution through the emergency departments that I think in a, in a really cool advance now, we have leave behind Narcan and clean injection kits from Worcester EMS. So our paramedics are able to leave um, these life-saving supplies right, when they, right where they find an overdose. I thought this paper was really cool. And I, it just like, you know, so again, this is, um, this is circa 2018. I found this really interesting because now we're sort of 10 years into 12 years into thinking about opioid prescribing. And this is a, an emergency medicine and toxicology paper from Penn um, with Dr. Delgado and Peroni looking at opioid prescribing for ankle sprains, right? And so for those of you that treat ankle sprains, you know, maybe sometimes there are people that you see that, that might require an opioid. Many do not. A lot of times it's more immobilization crutches. I, but when you look at the, the way that we prescribe across geographies, it's, it's really fascinating. So if you're somebody who's in North Dakota, you have like a 2.8% chance of getting an opioid for an ankle sprain. But if you're in Arkansas, you have like a 40% chance. And so it's just sort of an, an, intriguing, an intriguing study in the idea that probably they both can't be right, right? Like, you know, it's just that there is so much still left to be gained in terms of optimizing opioid prescribing, even, even in this current era. So COVID, um, you know, really changed everything. And I think that when we look at the, um, when, we, when we look at the disruption to people's access to care, to their social connectedness, to, um, to, to finances, what we saw during COVID was many people who lost their connections to long-term sobriety. And we also saw many people who started to develop their opioid use disorder. I, I wanted to show this picture because that's Dr. Stephanie Carrero and Dr. Jennifer Carey, two emergency physicians who graduated from the Brown EM residency program who are now my partners, who are, uh, who are just a, a joy to work with in this particular effort. And so, that brings us to today. And so when, when you look at these numbers, despite our efforts, we set yet another record in 2021 for the largest number of overdose deaths ever reported in America. And that number was nearly 108,000. Of these, more than 65% were due to high potency opioids like fentanyl. And now fentanyl is everywhere. So it's in the illicit opioid supply. It's basically replaced heroin. Like I said, in, in my community, you'd be hard pressed to find heroin metabolites when you do drug testing for opioid users because it's all fentanyl. There are these counterfeit opioids out there like Vicodin and Xanax. And so we'll frequently find that our patients are telling us that they don't use 
any illicit opioids, but they took a neighbor's Vicodin, they took some Vicodin that they bought on the street, and that turns out to be fentanyl. We're finding fentanyl contaminating stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine. So folks who never perceived that they were at risk for an opioid overdose are now dying of their overdose. And then I think that one of the biggest challenges is that on college campuses, we're seeing the substitution of things like ecstasy, which used to be sort of a party pill, um, with other high potency opioids like nitazines. And there was recently a cluster out in Ohio uh, where some college kids thought that they were getting into MDMA. It turned out to be a, a nitazine and there were multiple fatalities. What really has reframed my thinking about the opioid crisis is that every use of illicit fentanyl is accompanied by an immediate risk of death. So this is Russian roulette. And the lessons that we've learned from like Alcoholics Anonymous about um, sobriety and recovery, they're a lot different. When you talk about any relapse, any and, and particularly after a period of recovery, any loss of tolerance and then a relapse being a potentially fatal event, right? We're being robbed of the time to get these folks into treatment. So now when I see a 25 year old who presents after a fentanyl overdose, a bystander has probably given him naloxone before he comes in. And when he's awake and uncomfortable and maybe feeling a little bit sick, we'll use comfort medications to make that patient feel better. We ask the question, you want to think about Suboxone today? A lot of times when you ask that question, patients will say, no, doc, you know, this is never going to happen again. But I try to make sure that they go home with a prescription anyway, because that way they can decide tomorrow or the following day to go to the pharmacy and pick up their medication if they have a change of heart. They'll go with a naloxone kit in hand. They'll have social work and mental health assessments in order to decide whether or not they, they might be motivated to going into some sort of more formal treatment. A bridge clinic, um, the bridge clinic will call them with an appointment and they'll have a recovery coach involved in order to facilitate them getting into treatment. But is this enough? And so Dr. Uh, Dean Jane mentioned before this new mobile addiction service that we have in Worcester. Um, and to give you an idea of what we're doing, this is funded by the state of Massachusetts. We additionally have a $0 lease for a vehicle from the Kraft Family Foundation that should be coming next week, hopefully. Uh, the, these guys have been waiting along with me. Um, so we, we've we been providing care now in um, rolling suitcases and backpacks in shelters, encampments, and food pantries. Uh, I've got colleagues here from Family Medicine um, and then we've got emergency kits in terms of medications that we're able to provide. We've resuscitated one overdose in a parking lot. I, I think that the thing is that this is a, a much needed service in our community because for folks with entrenched drug use who don't have phones, who don't have transportation, who may not be organized enough to set up an appointment and go to healthcare, we're bringing the healthcare to them. This care is all free. We'll see you for any chief complaint. You want to talk about your blood pressure? You want to talk about the abscess on your arm? You want to get into addiction treatment? We'll do it. And we look at trying to be barrier busters. So if your main problem is you can't get your prescriptions at the pharmacy because of an ID, we'll have a community health advocate actually go out there with you. We launched this program one year ago, May 17th of 2021. Since then, we've had over 1,800 clinical encounters with over 745 patients that were reached. We've written for 500 Suboxone prescriptions, um, usually multiple Suboxone prescriptions to the same patient before they're able to get into brick and mortar treatment. We've gotten 16 folks into hep C treatment, which I, I love that number. Um, and then we've had multiple transports to the ED for suicidal ideation, for overdoses, for DKA. And we've used this platform to help vaccinate in our community. And we've done over 175 COVID vaccinations. So what can you do? Um, all of these people who are here today and anyone who's, who's watching the live stream, I know that this is an area that's close to your heart too. Thank you for coming. I think that one of the things that's been the hardest in this arena and mustering community action really has to do with stigma. And the idea that somehow these patients are less deserving of our best care than others. And so stigma is a set of negative and often unfair beliefs that a society or group of people have about something. I think in general, when you have st like stigma against a particular group of people or an idea, you know, you can sit down and, and be introspective about it and think about how you can 
reframe your, your um, biases around this topic. In this case, this is a life-threatening problem. And the reason that it's life-threatening is because our patients with this fulminant disease process should be able to come to every door in a medical center and get the care that they need. And instead, time and time again, what you'll hear is them talking about the trauma that they faced at the hands of their providers. I had a patient tell me this week, thank you for treating me like a person. And all I could think is, well, that is a low bleeping bar, right? So <laughs> I think that, you know, to the extent that we can get our providers to offer the same or better care to this population to make up to the injuries done, we have to do that. And this is the um, state against stigma. These are posters available from the state of Massachusetts for hanging up in your, in your clinic to show that you're an ally. So for the medical folks here, I, I really like it when the project managers refer to these as action items because what they're really telling me is like you have homework um, and here's what you need to do. So in terms of the medical folks here, your action items, if you don't already have your X waiver, please go and do this. The, the training at PCSS now is not required anymore. It's eight hours of free CME online, it is excellent. You will learn so much about methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, the neurobiology of addiction. It's totally, totally worth it. For the providers, I'd ask you to choose patient first language. What does that mean? I, I never correct patients if they refer to themselves as addicts or junkies, but I would certainly never use that terminology. I call them people with opioid use disorders. Like I would say people with diabetes or people with asthma. The words clean and dirty should leave our vocabularies. And instead we can say things like they had a positive drug test for cocaine metabolites and fentanyl. Abstinent, I think this one is, is not, as, a, not as, as sort of um, loaded, but I, I do like to use terms like this is a person in recovery, this is a person who has not been using fentanyl for the past six weeks. I think it's just more precise. Um, Drug abuse, we could just replace it with the word use. And again, it's just a, a sort of a, a less value-laden term. Um, and medically assisted treatment has got to go. Um, I think that the thing is that, you know, your, your medically assisted treatment, you know, we don't talk about insulin assisted treatment for diabetes. Again, this is an othering in addiction medicine. This is the evidence. We're following the evidence when we use these medications. But so many people like the phrase MAT that we can call them meds for addiction treatment and then keep them. Um, and again, to the providers, I would just ask that we be excellent to patients with opioid use disorders. Um, and again, I like this, this, uh, this poster that you can actually put up in your office or in your workspace that really shows that you're someone who can be an ally in this work. And I, I hate that we have to identify ourselves that way, but it's an opportunity for people to open up. For everyone, so because the homework is not just for the providers, um, I would encourage you to get leftover opioids out of your homes. And really this is because those opioids that are kind of sitting in a closet or sitting in a medicine cabinet, they're certainly, um, they're not making the people around you any safer and they contribute to sort of, to some of the paths into opioid use, including medical prescription opioid use or non-medical use. And so, with respect to getting opioids out of your homes, it, like so when you go home tonight or after the weekend, you know, find that, that extra bottle of Percocet or Tylenol number three that you have in a medicine cabinet. It's okay to flush it down the toilet. It's also okay to, to throw these out with kitty litter or coffee grounds. Um, but just, and then the last thing is that there are multiple apps that you can use in order to find the nearest disposal box in order to get rid of that medication. I'd encourage you to learn how to use naloxone and carry it. I carry naloxone with me you know, at campus dance. If you ran into someone who was unresponsive in a bathroom, if you go into a Dunkin' Donuts, you never know when you're gonna have the opportunity to save a life. And our overdose prevention fund has a really nice video in English and in Spanish, very well acted by people you might recognize um, in terms of uh, naloxone rescue breathing and CPR. And I would ask you all to advocate for humane policies. Um, when you look at some of the biggest barriers to, to getting the right thing done for people with opioid use disorders, it is public perception. This is the insight 
uh, supervised consumption facility in Vancouver where they have resuscitated thousands of people who were able to use in a safe place. Any one of them could have died that day if they were using by themselves, but trying to get these types of, of programs stateside or trying, you know, in, in Europe, there have been like seven randomized controlled trials on how useful prescription heroin has been in preventing deaths. Imagine making that leap here. Um, so I think that when you have the opportunity to advocate for humane policy, that's critical. And I would ask you to destigmatize treatment. Um, this is our methadone clinic spectrum on Lincoln Street. And I feel like even today when you're watching you know, sitcoms or primetime television, jokes are made at the expense of people who are in treatment. We should be celebrating these folks, not, not, uh, not treating them like objects of scorn. And finally, I would just ask you to care for families who love someone with an addiction. And as I was kind of talking to my colleagues about this, they were like, you know, that casserole or that phone call that you make to someone with a cancer diagnosis, when do we do that for people that are struggling with psychiatric disease or addictive disorders? So when we look at kind of where we're going from here, this is the, uh, this is the International Overdose Awareness Day, and we plant this field of flags to memorialize everyone who died of an opioid overdose each year in Massachusetts. We plant thousands of flags. Uh, this is my, my friend and colleague, Brittany Chapman, joined by two little boys who have been profoundly affected by the opioid epidemic. And I think that this is a story of loss, this is a story of regret, but it's also a story of hope. And I feel like in 2032, we'll look back on this time and, and think about the things we got right and the things that we got wrong, but hopefully we'll see ourselves bend the curve. Beyond opioids, in this story, the things that I've learned is that cutting edge evidence medicine changes and evolves. Humility and agility are key. Surrounding yourself with, with just incredible role models and people who can accelerate your work um, are, are essential. And finally, I think that, again, you know, it, this is an interesting space in which to work because the temptation to be cutting or be caustic when you could be compassionate in these moments behind closed doors, when your frustration is just boiling over, it's always there. And I don't think I'm the only one. But there are people, like the people in the front row, who, uh, who exert their own gravity. And my parents, my husband, my sister, my friends, who just expect so much that in those moments where you're determining what your character is by yourself as a, as a provider, um, they, they kind of rein you in. And you go home being true to the person that you'd hoped you'd been when you graduated, right? So acknowledgments, oh my gosh, there are so many people. Thank you so much, especially thank you to my family, again, to to Dr. Alper, to Dr. Klein, to Dr. Rosen, Dean Jane, Dr. Shin, thank you all so much. And to the Sauber family, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk about this with you today. I'd like to say congratulations to the graduating classes of 2020 and 2022. We need you now more than ever. And then if you have any questions, I apologize for, for not leaving much time for questions here, um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to send me a message. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, can I ask a question? I'm not, I'm not a medical person. Um, can I just ask a question? Is the ratio of deaths to people who use opioids a good gauge of the effectiveness of treatment? And how has it changed over time? And how does it vary by state to state? Um, and so I, I, the, the question, if I, can, if I can rephrase it, and hopefully I'm getting this right, is, is the ratio of people who use opioids to deaths or um, folks seeking treatment, is that a good gauge of where we are in the epidemic and how is it different regionally? Um, did I get that right? Kind of. Sorry. I think so, but it's the second example. Um, HIV in the 80s, um, deaths to infections is very different to HIV now, where deaths to infections is massively lower, which is a result of completely different different treatments now versus 30, 40 years ago. No, and that's a, that's a totally valid example. And I think in many parallels, 
um, what we see is that it's hard to measure an occult population. And so one of the challenges, I think, overall is trying to figure out what the census of individuals who have an opioid use disorder truly is. And it looks really different because the folks who have, for example, an oxycodone addiction are going to look different potentially than the folks who have a, a fentanyl use disorder who are gonna look different than the people who have a combined fentanyl and stimulant disorder, which I feel like it, in some ways is, is one of the most challenging pieces to treat. Um, we're still seeing an increase in the number of deaths. And I actually thought at some point that just because the numbers were so big in Massachusetts, we would start to see like a dramatic decline because we couldn't replace the number of patients with opioid use disorders as fast as we were losing them. But we haven't seen that yet. After like a, the smallest plateau, we're still going up right now. I do think we're engaging more people with treatment but even that is sort of challenging because of the inequities in treatment. So we're engaging more patients in treatment, but our access to treatment is the worst, particularly among black men who have the highest rate of increase in terms of the overdose deaths that we're seeing in mass right now. I think one of the challenges, much like HIV, is that um, you know, are you getting the treatment to the right folks at the right time? but also the regional politics. And so to give you an example, in Indiana years ago, um, they stopped their syringe exchange services, saw a cluster of HIV infections as a result. Here in, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, I feel like not only is syringe exchange uh, accepted and kind of um, longstanding, but we also have multiple different treatment modalities. Um, I don't think that I got all of that, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that question afterwards. But yeah, I, I appreciate what you're asking. And I just, I don't think that we're at a point in the epidemic yet where we can say our, our treatments are really grabbing hold of certain populations just because the numbers are, are still, we're still in the, the 80s to 90s part of the curve, I feel like, with respect to HIV. Excuse me. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I'm from uh, Berkeley, California, and um, one of the programs that we found very effective in Alameda County was a, a BOOP program through the ER, like you're describing. One aspect that proved to be important, and the, the pandemic has disrupted a lot of this, was to not just wait for uh, the Bridge Clinic to give the patient an appointment, but to give them an appointment at that time in the ER to go to a Bridge Clinic Near, as near to their home as possible within 12 hours. So they got the original prescription and they got the immediate uh, follow-up. No questions about insurance, Medi-Cal, you know, any of that. Just uh, get them get them started before there was a chance to, to lose them. And okay. I think that that's a good way to go. I applaud your uh, mobile program also. I think it's great. Thank you so much. And that's, that's awesome. That's outstanding work. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Thank you for the talk, and I, you can feel your commitment and your kindness, which is great. Um, my concern is that this is a class uh, war, and um, much of what you shared is within a short radius of services that you are fortunate to have access to. But uh, I want to leave you with the idea of illicit health care, that the... Um, communities that have no resources, you know, uh, they treat themselves in the street and there's nothing for them. Uh, to, I'm a little bit taken because I have a personal connection to this problem. And to get a person into detox, if they have no resources, they ask you for $8,000. They want to push you through a seven-day detox with an aggressive taper, and uh, the person travels through nightmares, and it's a horror show. Then if you're fortunate, they don't kick you out the door at that time. They move you to a social support level where they push, um, not, they push now on you various opioids, uh, um, uh, to kind of calm you down uh, from the experience you just had of this nightmare for seven days. 
and then you run out of money and they kick you out the door. And literally they say, come and pick this person up. It's Friday afternoon, they can't stay anymore. And then what do you do, right? And the person who really wants to leave this experience does not want Suboxone. They do not want methadone. They know that detox from Suboxone is almost worse than detoxing from fentanyl. They don't, and they know that if they go on to Suboxone and they return home, they have to worry about now how they're going to get to the Suboxone clinic because they don't own a car. Okay, so I'm really concerned that the um, medical community is in a little bit of a bubble on this and rec not uh, recognizing the segmentation in the community. A person who gets um, op addiction because of the opioid that was prescribed to them, guess what? They have health care. Okay, I'm gonna, so I, I'm going to just. Um, Yes, you know, I I think that the thing is that from, from what you first described, um, vulnerable people bring predatory practices. And so we've certainly seen the, the ultra rapid detox, the cash for detox, we've, we've seen the outgrowth of those types of, of entities. Um, I think that one of the things is that we've seen is that we, we've got some really nice strategies now that we didn't have before for tapering people from buprenorphine, if that, from Suboxone, if that's their desire. Um, there's a lot of, of kind of perception, like you said, of, of folks having trouble tapering, but a lot of those were because they were either cut off or had to self-taper. I think that the challenge, though, and to your point, is that when we talk about starting people with medications for addiction treatment, we have to be prepared for talking to them about how they're going to stop it if that's their interest. And so that was one of the things that we've come to really understand. But ultimately, the, the last thing that I would say about this is that is that you're right. There are huge treatment deserts. And the reason that we're able to do these things in our community is because the state is funding it. I couldn't provide free care and transportation and you know rapid entry into a lot of these programs if somebody wasn't paying for it. And so I'm very lucky to live in a progressive state that has sort of put a value on these things. I don't know how folks are doing this in other places, to be quite honest. Um, and so again, like credit to the Baker administration, to Mass DPH and the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services for, for wanting to do this work. Well, it's the rural community I'm concerned about. Yeah. And a, a model for success that I've seen firsthand is two weeks in a, ta a, two weeks in a detox, a, a week transition in an isolated, not returning to your environment, another two weeks in intensive psychological care. I, I, not a doctor, but I think this is a psychological, you said in your talk, maybe it's psychological. I think it's hugely psychological. And McLean Hospital, NECOG, and Peter Sam Mass is an excellent model if you're not already familiar with them. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I'm gonna be here afterwards if there's any additional questions. I'd love to talk to you. Well, thank you. Hi, um, many thanks to you, to all of you, for your work in this field, your concern. Coming at it now from a different um, angle, is there any work in genetics? Because, you know, with my family, I lost my mother and my brother to, you know, addiction issues. And as a mother, I would have loved if the amnio, you know, synthesis, you know, if the analysis, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not a doctor, but when they do the amnio, if the genetic, if the geneticist could have told me, yeah, this one has, you know, predisp predisposition to having an addiction issue, this one doesn't. You know, I stopped my career because I wanted to keep a close eye. They never had an allowance trying to watch the money flow because I never wanted them, you know, to end up with trouble. So far, so good. They're in their 20s. But um, I'm really grateful to all of you.
Thank you. No, thank you. And, and I'm sorry for your loss and thank you for sharing your story. I think that what I anticipate might be a little bit different than what you're talking about. Um, one of my partners, who's, who's a brilliant opioid researcher and an emergency clinician, Stephanie Carrero, is looking at using different mobile technologies um, to, to look for cues for craving and, and tolerance um, and signals for return to drug use. But one of the things that she's talked a lot about is helping to create phenotypes um, in terms of kind of like who are the folks who are going to be most susceptible to, um, to developing an opioid use disorder. And I, I really think that this, this idea, you know, kind of dovetails with this whole idea of personalized medicine. Um, it's interesting because I don't think that the genetic predisposition tells the whole story. I, I agree with you about the overlay of, of psychology and psychiatry. And I certainly agree with the idea that like, you know, I, if, if I'm primed to be the world's worst methamphetamine addict, and, and that may be where my brain chemistry is, the fact that I was never exposed to methamphetamine means that that can't happen. So the genetic predisposition doesn't tell the whole story, but I think that some of this phenotyping work may. And I, I think that's gonna be awesome because right now the tools that we have to try to stratify who's at risk and who, who is not, they're very broad strokes. Stop there. Um, there's Thank a reception you. in the hall. Please join us, and maybe Dr. Lulu will hang for extra questions. I'm happy to. Thank you all. So Thank you, you all. so much. Thank you, Thank you.